Hey, everybody. Hi, everybody. I sound like Danny Ritchie. No offense to Danny Ritchie. We're both from the South. Hey, everybody. Um, today, I've got the review for the ELAC Debut 3. It's the DB63. So it's the bookshelf speaker that features the 6.5-inch midwoofer. These retail for about $450 per pair. And I actually bought them myself with funds from Patreon. So if you'd like to support this channel, you can do that by going to patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. And you can sign up for a monthly deal where maybe you kick a few bucks my way to help support what I'm doing. And in exchange, you get to see these kind of reviews in advance before anybody else gets to see them. You get sneak peeks of what I'm doing. Sometimes that gets me in trouble. Uh, you get polls, you get input on what I'm doing, what I'm reviewing, and so on. Also, you can use any of my generic affiliate links in the description below. So if you need to buy these speakers or a TV or a projector or a curling iron or anything like that, Amazon, Target, Crutchfield, etc. Okay, so overall, the impression that I get from these speakers are that in terms of build quality, they're pretty darn robust. I was actually impressed by it. The overall looks, I like the little waveguide on front of the tweeter. It's, it's an interesting design, and I understand how it works because I've experienced other speakers with a similar waveguide. In particular, Tang Band, if you look at some of their tweeters from like, and they still make them, but I think they really started coming out with them around maybe like 2010, 2011, 2012, somewhere around that point where they've got that little lens in front of their tweeter. Now, this particular ELAC tweeter is a little bit different where it doesn't have a full lens covering up the dome tweeter. And instead, it just kind of has like a partition in the lens. It's an interesting design. It's supposed to help spread the off-axis response more evenly. We'll see if that works. And yes, it is called a waveguide because theoretically, or actually, actually, it does guide the wave. So it is a waveguide, but it's not a waveguide in the traditional sense that you're probably used to. It's interesting. Okay, let's talk about specs real fast while I show you a video. These feature a one inch aluminum dome tweeter, a six and a half inch third generation Aramid fiber cone woofer, power handling a spec at 20 to 140 watts, impedance is spec at six ohm, sensitivity is spec at 87 decibels, and this is a ported enclosure. Weight is about 17 pounds each. And if you want that in kilograms, I'm not that good at math, but you can Google it. A couple things up front. When I talk about positioning of these speakers, I'm going to be talking about on axis and off axis. So on axis is pointed directly at you and off axis is not pointed directly at you at any angle. Kind of like what you see here in this graphic. In this graphic, black is on axis pointed directly at the listener position. Red is towed out 30 degrees. Now these are kind of the typical aiming and anywhere in between is normally what you're gonna see in somebody's listening room. When I talk about putting them near a wall, this is what I'm talking about. X feet from the wall, from the back of the speaker. Now, in my experience with these speakers, they sound best when pointed directly at the listener position. If you tow them out and face them away from the listener position, that top end kind of drops off. So you lose like cymbal crashes, you lose air. And in my opinion, there's a softness to the upper register that I just don't prefer. There's another thing that goes on with these speakers in the lower mid-range, mid-range area from about maybe 300 hertz to 600 hertz where there's a little bit of a dip. Now this could be intentionally designed that way or it could just be because they didn't have the money to spend for a budget-minded speaker where they're going to do proper baffle step compensation. I'm not the engineer. I don't have insight into why this is what it is, but there's a little bit of a suck out in that mid-range area, about about maybe one and a half decibels. And what it does is it takes out a little bit of that voice, that natural uh, maybe bloom to a, to a voice, especially a male vocal. And it makes it sound a little bit what I would consider hollow, okay? There's also a pretty strong resonance. And when I say strong, I don't necessarily mean audible, but it's a high Q resonance. Uh, and it covers around maybe 650 hertz to 750 hertz. You're going to see it in the data, so we'll dive a little bit more into that then. As far as audibility goes, i got to be honest with you, it's not something that I could hear, at least where it was a problem. So what I have is the Wim Ultra, and I use that to feed a pair of March Audio P501 monoblock amplifiers. Each amplifier is rated at like 500 watts at 4 ohm, and there's one for the left speaker and one for the right speaker. With the whim, you can go in and you can adjust the EQ via the app. So in the app, what I did was I went to that resonance. Again, I can't remember exactly what frequency it is, but I went to that resonance. I set a Q of about 10 or so, and I brought that down. And then I just A-beat it. Turned the EQ on, turned the EQ off. 
when it was off, the speaker was in its normal state. When the EQ was on, the speaker had that resonance EQ down. And that's when I was like, can I hear this difference or can I not? Now, naturally, because I know that I'm toggling this thing on and off, I'm listening for that to be gone or that to be there. I'm expecting, that's the expectation bias, right? So if I'm trying to be as honest with myself as I possibly can, I couldn't really hear that issue to the point where I would say it's very problematic, but in terms of objective data, it's there. Another thing that I noticed about these speakers was that there's a little bit of clarity or detail missing around the two to three kilohertz area. So in terms of speech intelligibility, it suffers a little bit. And I'm, I'm really kind of picking nits here, okay? That's down maybe like one to two decibels. So it's in that region where you might notice it, but you might not. And you may be more inclined to notice it because it covers a little bit of a broader range. If you quickly A beat it, okay? If you quickly A beat it, then you might be like, oh, okay, I, I can tell that there is less attack. There's less detail in that upper mid range area. But without that, you don't really have a reference to go by. So it wouldn't stand out as something that bothers you per se, as opposed to it potentially having like a bump there. If there was a bump at two to three kilohertz of about one to two decibels, in my experience, it's gonna stand out as a little bit grating and maybe harsh, maybe glare, if you wanna call it that. And so that would be a problem because it's a little bit of a dip, that's okay. I notice a lot of manufacturers will actually purposely put that in there, but I don't believe that's the case with this particular speaker. But again, I don't really know for sure because I'm not the engineer. Quickly, how does this compare to the DB62? Well, in terms of objective data, if you look at these back to back, there's pros and cons for each, and you could probably argue either way. But in my opinion, based on the data and based on what I've heard, because I've also reviewed the DB62, I'm going to prefer these speakers. And the one reason that I'm going to prefer the DB63 is because the 62 is very sibilant and that's a crossover issue. You cannot resolve that with simple equalization. You actually have to would modify the crossover or get a better speaker. And in this case, I would say, if you're looking at this and you're saying, I had the DB62, should I upgrade to the DB63? I would say that if you have the money, then yes. But if it's gonna be tight and it's gonna be hard for you to justify, then just hang on to what you've got. You're not really missing out on a lot, but the DB63 is better. So if you do have the extra money right now and you wanna step up to something a little bit better, but still within the budget realm, the DB63 is a safe choice for you. In terms of bass output, how low do these go? Everybody wants to know, how low do these speakers go? Do I need a subwoofer? Yeah, you're gonna need a subwoofer. There's very rarely the occasion that I review a speaker where I would not recommend a subwoofer or where I would say a subwoofer is not necessary. And usually what happens is if that speaker gets down to 40 hertz before it starts to roll off, then for most music, you can probably get away without using a subwoofer. But I would say by and large, most speakers tend to roll off above about 50 to 60 hertz, somewhere in that region, especially bookshelf speakers. And therefore, I would always recommend a subwoofer. So I'm going to recommend a subwoofer with these if you want response and if you want lower bass below about 40 hertz in room, okay? 50 hertz is kind of pushing it with these speakers because they start to roll off somewhere around, let me look here, 76 hertz, okay? That's the F3 and the F10 is at 40 hertz. But if you've been paying attention to this channel and you kind of understand the data a little bit, you understand that the F3, which is the negative 3 dB point compared to the fundamental or the overall mean sound pressure, it's at 76. So here's your here's your response. It's starting to let me roll, let me do it in verse, okay? This is the higher frequency, this is the lower frequency. Speakers coming in, starting to roll off around 76 hertz. So it's negative 3 B 3 dB down from here. Now at 40 hertz, it's negative 10 dB down from the mean. That's a long window where you have a shallow roll off. And for that reason, you could put these speakers close to a wall. I don't necessarily recommend that you have to, but you could. And what that will do is that will boost up the bottom end even more, but you do potentially run into the issue of bringing in a little bit too much boominess. So I do recommend playing with that. I don't think necessarily that you're gonna to wanna to bring the speaker out really far from the wall. And in terms of the audiophile world, everybody will say at least three feet from the wall, but when I'm talking about a speaker that's $450 per pair and the majority of my viewers, you most likely, are listening to these in living room type setups where you don't have room to bring a speaker six feet or maybe even three feet off the wall, 
then you want to know, is it okay if I put it close to a wall? Maybe that's what you're looking for. Something like the Kith, uh, the Q3 that I just reviewed, those have a roll off where they start to roll off kind of quick, but then they scoot back up a little bit on the lower end and then they roll off really quick, okay? That's a speaker that you could put really close to a wall because it will not sound boomy and it's got a little bit of a lift on the bottom end. With these, because they're so rolled off, you could put them close to a wall, but you do have to be careful about giving too much weight to the to the upper subwoofer area or the lower mid bass area. So we're talking 50 hertz to 70 hertz. Somewhere in that region put, could potentially sound a little bit too lifted. So just keep that in mind. Now, before I get into the data, what I want to do is give you a couple examples for what you could do with equalization. Because if you have something like the WIM amp or the WIM ultra or a mini DSP or something that allows you to go in and tailor make your own equalization, then you can take a budget speaker that sounds okay and make it sound a lot better. Now it's not gonna fix directivity problems, crossover issues, you can't do that with equalization, but you can make the overall sound more to your liking. So if that's what you want to do, I'm gonna give you some examples right now. Right now what I'm showing on screen is the on-axis response. And you'll see more of this in a little bit, but this is the on-axis anechoic response. The speaker pointed directly at the listener, okay? Anechoic, without the room involved. And you can see, here's the resonance that I was talking about around 660 Hertz. And here's this little bit of a dip in the mid range area. And here's this little bit of a dip from two to three, actually it's like two to four kilohertz, okay? So if I go in and I add equalization, this is the result I get right through here. And it smooths out. So really what I was targeting is, let's go ahead and get rid of the resonance because why not? Let's go ahead and bring up this mid range dip because why not? And let's go ahead and bring up this upper mid range, lower treble dip again, because why not? You've got the equalization, you might as well use it. And if you wanna know how to set that up, here you go. Set a low shelf filter at 650 plus one and a half dB, a peak at 660, another peak at 550, and another peak at 3000 Hertz. Use these right here to set up your EQ and you will have a more improved sound quality. So now let's talk about the data. The data allows me to provide you with a better response to the questions of how should I aim the speaker? Where should I put it? How far off the wall? Should I put my ear at the tweeter level or is it designed to be listened to at another height? Those kind of things. I can listen for those things and I can try to relay my experience to you, but it's subjective. And there's nothing wrong with subjective. The whole purpose of this channel is to understand how the subjective relates to the measurements. And if you can take the measurements and make sense of the subjective, then when you look at other measurements, you can say, oh, this speaker behaves this way. Maybe it has a high frequency tilt. Maybe it has a mid-range cutout. Maybe it has a mid-range boost. Maybe it rolls off at a certain frequency and you're trying to figure out if you need a subwoofer. But you can say, this speaker behaves this way and I'm wanting this. Maybe this one isn't for me. I'm gonna focus on these other ones. Then I'm gonna order these other ones. I'm gonna try those out in my room and I'm gonna send the other ones back. That's ideally how you approach shopping for the best speaker for your budget. Even if we're not talking lifelong end game speakers, it still makes sense to have objective data to look at what you can purchase and make sense of it. Okay, there's my spiel. So all this data is collected using my Clipple near field scanner. It is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic room, such as my garage, which you see here. Starting off with the impedance, we can see some resonances, likely from the enclosure, but it could also be the port or it could be something else that I'm not sure of. But most of the time in speakers in this budget region, it's gonna be enclosure resonance, maybe due to uh, non-optimal bracing or maybe non-optimal damping inside the enclosure. The overall impedance dips down to about 4.4 ohm. So you should be fine with an AVR to drive these. I mean, generally I would say if it gets below four ohm, then you may want a separate amplifier, but with an AVR, you probably will be okay. The on-axis frequency response shows us a pretty decent window of response. Sensitivity averaged at about 86.2. Linearity is within about two and a half decibels. It's pretty good. Now, if we take some of those equalization recommendations I had, then you can smooth this out a little bit more. But otherwise, you can see the areas that I'm talking about. Here's your resonance. Here's a little bit of a dip. Here's a little bit of a dip. And then the top end is starting to roll off a little bit. F3 at 76 hertz, F10 at 40 hertz. I've already covered that. CEA 2034 data set. Let's look at the directivity. We do have a droop in the directivity above about 2K. So what's happening is the handoff from the midwoofer to the tweeter, it's not perfect. That midwoofer is narrowing up in radiation and that tweeter comes in and it's broad in radiation. As it goes higher in frequency, it narrows up 
But at the lower frequencies, it's very broad. So it's doing like this, where that midwoofer is more forward, forward sounding, I guess, maybe is the best way to put it. You take these two things into account, you've got a discontinuity in the radiation field of that speaker. And if you take into account that the tweeter is up here and the midwoofer is down here, then you also have a discontinuity there as well. The only way to get around that is to either put the tweeter right in the middle of that midwoofer and or put that crossover point so low that the woofer is no longer beaming or narrowing and that tweeter is still wide and you basically have the same dispersion pattern. But the problem with that is in order to do so, you've got to cross that tweeter over so low that you're likely going to fry it. I mean, of course you're going to introduce distortion, but you're likely just going to flat out fry it because you would have to cross a tweeter over before the midwoofer starts beaming and a six and a half inch midwoofer physically starts beaming at about a quarter wavelength, which is around 800 to a thousand Hertz. So that's where you cut across that tweeter at. You're just not going to do that. Estimated interim response and the line represents how I heard the speaker in my room. Shallow roll off means place it near the wall is acceptable and likely preferred. A bit hollow in this mid range, some loss in detail in this upper mid range, lower treble region and then towed out at 30 degrees will likely sound soft because I don't know how else to say there's not a lot of air. There's not a lot of content that you're going to hear as well because the radiation is narrowing up quite a bit above about five kilohertz or so. Horizontal contour plot is pretty good about plus or minus 60 degrees. So it's pretty nice and wide. You're going to have nice wide sound stage, but that does dip down to about plus or minus 40 degrees in this region, which is about five kilohertz. Vertical window, you need to be within plus or minus 20 degrees of that tweeter for optimal sound. And ideally, you're going to be right at that tweeter level with your ears. Distortion at 86 decibels looks pretty good. At 96 decibels, it starts to increase, but to me, it's still pretty good. Multi-tone distortion, however, shows us some issues in the mid-range. So we've creeped up above this 3% distortion threshold that I personally go by. And if you see, you can see it's about 200 hertz to about maybe 900 hertz, one kilohertz or so. What happens if you use a subwoofer? You get this. So it does bring down that mid-range distortion a little bit, but not a lot. I'm going to go back to full band. Okay, so you can see right through here, using a subwoofer at 80, 80 hertz or so, will bring you down to about right here. And in terms of dynamic range, this is what we have from 76 decibels to 102 decibels. That's 26 decibels of dynamic range. Can the speaker provide you that, taking it one meter? Uh, overall, I'd say you're probably okay, especially when you consider the price of the speaker. It's actually not bad at all, but more than likely you're going to be within about 20 decibels of dynamic range for this speaker. So just keep that in mind if you're trying to listen to the speaker at loud levels. The compression, dynamic range, and the distortion, all those things factor into how loud can I listen to the speaker or how far away can I listen to the speaker and still maintain a volume that I'm listening for. In my experience, in my living room at about 10 feet away, these speakers were good to about 90 decibels, and then that's when that lower mid-range distortion started to creep in. At least that's what it sounded like. Uh, the other thing is that if I went higher than that, I started to lose some attack in the kick drum area from like 50 to 60 hertz. It felt like it was starting to fall off. And I can kind of see why now when I'm looking at this, because I'm losing about a decibel from low to higher volume. So that's what creates that limited dynamic range. And that does it for this review. If you like what I'm doing here and you would like to help, I mentioned those two ways earlier. Just remember, you can use my generic affiliate links. You can go to crutchville.com. You can type in ELAC 63. You can buy it through that. That earns me a small commission at no additional cost to you. And I certainly appreciate that. I think that covers everything I needed to. If you like the video, thumbs up. That definitely helps the channel out. And I appreciate that as well. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.